Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Wonder Goal, the soccer betting podcast from the Action Network. My name is Michael Leboff. Joining me, as always, will be my friends and colleagues, BJ Cunningham and Anthony DeBundo. We had a lot of fun uh, on our, our last episode covering Premier League Match Week 5 until, once again, Everton spoiled everything. Um, but this this episode will be a lot better because there is no Everton to talk about in the Champions League. Somehow they didn't qualify. Um, but we'll go through match week one, Tuesday and Wednesday. We're going to spend some time on the matches that we have plays in. We'll touch on everything, but we'll spend our, the majority of our time giving out the games we feel ha- have the most value. So uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think we'll be deep diving into Barcelona and Royal Antwerp too much, but maybe we'll sprinkle in a little bit of analysis. But before we go through all 16 matches... A reminder that Wonder Goal is proudly presented by Bet365, and Bet365 doesn't do ordinary. It believes that every sport should be epic, every match, every game, every goal, every play, from the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. See for yourself when you sign up today with code ACTION, and you'll get $365 in bonus bets when you bet just $1. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. You must be 21 or older. You must be president. Excuse me. You must be present. In Colorado, Iowa, New Jersey, Ohio, or Virginia in the United States. And if you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, please call 1-800-GAMBLER in Colorado, New Jersey, Ohio, and Virginia. Or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms and conditions apply. Uh, BJ and Anthony will start on Tuesday. And we'll start with the 1245 kickoff with AC Milan. They're hosting Newcastle in what is essentially a pick on the three-way line. It's plus 155 for Milan. Newcastle plus 162 in the draw is plus 260. I like the draw here, and I think we're kind of all on the same page, Anthony, that this feels like it's, it could be a pretty like lumbering match. Yeah, entirely. I think that Newcastle, uh, when is given the opportunity – wants to slow games to a crawl. They want to be conservative at heart. And you kind of saw that against Brentford and uh, in stretches of their other matches, even when they had the lead against Liverpool up a man, you know, they weren't taking a lot of chances in possession. They were prioritizing having a very good defense. And it's a defense that I think is very, very good. Uh, And they've shown that over the last calendar year in the Premier League. And they've shown uh, that when they're healthy and their fullback four is available, that they're going to be very difficult to break down. And Milan is a team that isn't going to take a ton of chances out of possession or in possession either. They, they kind of just, uh, you know, they'll have some defensive possession. They're very comfortable playing without the ball. Uh, they actually got ripped apart against Inter in those transition moments on Saturday. And that was what I was worried about with them with, with that matchup. And this is not the same thing here because I think that they're uh, going to be even more cautious. And I don't think Newcastle... Uh, has the same level of attacking talent that that Inter team did, you know, with Tehran basically one man showing the first two goals uh, and, and setting them up. You know, I think that both teams lean toward conservative in this group. It's so important not to lose matches and to to kind of keep things tight. That this game is priced way too high to the over, given how much uh, these two attacks are, are. You know, outside of Rafael Liao and you know, I do expect Isak to start because they rotated him. That does mean Wilson won't start. I think Almiron's going to start. Like I think Howe has made some decisions on Saturday or on in Saturday's match against Brentford that suggest that he's going to play the Almiron for his defensive work, Isak up top, no Callum Wilson and and Anthony Gordon, and I just don't really think that's their best attacking lineup. So I think they're going to struggle to break down Milan, and I think that you know if you can, can slow down Liao at all, this Milan attack just isn't that good. So I think this is going to be a grinded out kind of game. I agree with you know the draw having some value, and I think there's uh, value in the under. Two and a half at plus 120. Uh, this should be right around two and a half for me. So the fact that I'm getting plus 120, I'm going to take that and, and, and bet it. Yeah, I like to draw. Uh, it's plus 260. I just think it, it sets up really well. Like you said, it's, it's two teams that are okay with walking out of this match, I think, with a, with a point, too, considering this is Group F. This is the group of death. Uh, I don't – it's it's basically a, a – in the matches when you're not playing PSG, like you, you don't want to. You're going to play to get whatever you can out of it. I think if you're, that's going to be the mentality of uh, Newcastle, Milan, and uh, Dortmund. So, yeah, it just has all the makings. 
and you look at the um, the underlying metrics too for for Newcastle. When you take the the teams, kind of not including some of the uh, the dregs of the Premier League, they are the them and Arsenal are two low event teams uh, in that kind of top twelve. When you look at XG for and against, so I just don't think I can see either team running away with this match. So uh, I think the draw is going to be in play the whole way out. Um, BJ, you do lean one way though. I do, and I, I think there is some value on Newcastle draw no bet at uh, plus one, or excuse me, at even money. The interesting thing that I see in this type of matchup is I agree with Anthony that AC Milan is going to stay very, very passive. If you look at their metrics from Serie A so far this season, they have the lowest amount of high turnovers forced of any team in Italy, which is kind of weird considering the teams that they've played. Obviously, they've played Inter, but they've also played some mid to low table teams, so it just shows you how passive Pioli has been with his low block. And so now I'm concerned if AC Milan is not going to be primarily transitional. I don't know how they're going to build up against the Newcastle press. We've seen it time and time again that Newcastle has the most physical press and the most physical defense to play through in the Premier League. You don't see that type of physicality in Serie A most week in and week out. And even if you look at the teams that AC Milan played throughout the Champions League last season in the knockout round. They played Tottenham, who was a very passive team. They played Napoli, who is a decent counter-pressing team, but they're not physical like Newcastle is. And then they got worked pretty badly by Inter. And then obviously, you know, this past weekend, they Inter beat them pretty bad again. So Newcastle, big for them. Sven Bowman played this weekend, so they have their full back four healthy. And even if you look just from a mathematical standpoint, Newcastle, obviously last season, plus 0.8 actually differential in, in the Premier League. AC Milan plus 0.5 XG differential in Serie A. By my uh, power ratings using UEFA coefficients and total transfer value for each league, I have England rated half a goal per 90 better than Italy at this point. So I think even if you're accounting for home field advantage for AC Milan, I think there's still a good enough value here on Newcastle, which I think is a more talented team than AC Milan too. So it's Newcastle drawing on bet at even money for me, who I think should be a slight favorite here on the road against AC Milan. All right, we'll stay in uh, the group of death. That is Group F. So that's the 12.45 kickoff. This is a 3 p.m. Eastern time. The other 12.45 uh, is Young Boys and Leipzig. Uh, so pretty good bet that most eyeballs are going to be on Milan and Newcastle in Newcastle's return to your European football. But for this one, PSG is hosting Dortmund. Uh, their odds on minus 134 in Paris. Uh, Dortmund traveling at plus 350 and the draw plus 280. In terms of results, PSG struggling a bit in legal under Louis uh, Enrique, uh, but I'm not too concerned. Everything kind of looks like it's going to check out and be okay. Anthony, you were pretty high on PSG in terms of the big picture here in the Champions League, uh, despite being in the group of death. Um, and you are the only one here that has a bet to give out on uh, PSG and Dortmund. Yeah, I'm going to be uh, Joe Square, Barney at the bar, uh, and I'm going to bet the over in this game. Three goals. Uh, I like what I'm seeing from this PSG attack. And I know that, uh, you know, Enrique historically and traditionally has been a little bit maybe too possession heavy and passive um, at times. And that's been a problem when they've gone up against good defensive sides who are able to just kind of sit off and, and let them have the ball. But there is zero resistance in this Dortmund defense. There is zero defensive midfield ball winning. They do not stop you from getting into the penalty area. And if you give me the quality of attackers in this game with Mbappe, Ramos, and Dembele on one side, I think PSG's attack has a chance to run wild here. Because my biggest concern about PSG is honestly like the inexperience and lack of midfield solidity and my biggest concern about Dortmund is the lack of midfield solidity so this has the potential to be very back and forth and Dortmund's attack um, without Bellingham took you know I think is going to go through some drawing pains but they you know showing signs of coming out of it but this is a Dortmund team that has now conceded at least one expected goal in every Bundesliga match and they have not played any good teams in the Bundesliga like Freiburg is the best team that they've played from an attacking perspective and I would not consider them to be anything more than just like a slightly above average attack. They played a uh, Heidenheim and, and completely blew the lead. They, they struggled with Bochum in transition a lot. 
Uh, and, and Cologne had 26 touches in their penalty area. So all of these teams, by the way, Cologne still without a win, Bochum uh, still without a win as far as I'm concerned. And then Heidenheim, I believe, just got their first win today. So, you know, they're playing all these bad teams in the Bundesliga and giving up chance after chance after chance. Now Mbappe, you know, they go to Paris to face Mbappe. And I don't really think Dortmund does enough to press to keep PSG from pinging balls to Kylian all game long. Um, so give me the over. Uh, I think Dortmund gets on the board too here. So uh, I'm going to go with that. Uh, normally I like to bet the under in the big match, especially because the total tends to get inflated. And we've seen this with PSG time and time again. But this Dortmund team kind of plays right into their hands. So over three goals. I have, I have like a smidgen of interest in parlaying PSG and Leipzig, but uh, we'll see. I have a lot more interest in this next match uh, as this BJ. Real quick, uh, the, the market has come down a lot on PSG after the loss yeah. to Nice on Friday. Which is so crazy. We were looking at it. It was like minus 165, 160 most places, and, and that has come down to minus 130. If we got to like 115, I would fire on PSG at home, but because uh, I, I do think they're the better team and they're at home, so a little cheap. But I will be uh, passing on the side as of now. All right, BJ and me uh, are going to be on the same side of this one. Feyenoord yeah. is hosting Celtic uh, minus 167 for We the Nord, uh, who come in in rip-roaring form. Oh, yeah. 17 goals in the last three games uh, in the Eredivisie, seven, outscoring opponents 17-3. Uh, Celtic, though, I mean, a little bit of a different beast than I think what they're going to see. Um in the Netherlands, especially Brendan Rodgers is Celtic, right? Like it's going to be compact, playing to the situation, which is we're on the road in the Champions League. Let's try to get a point out of out of this match. Uh, Celtics plus four fifty, and the draws three to one. I think Celtics worth worth a shot mm-hmm. here. I just don't think that the difference between the two teams is even with home field advantage is wide enough for this number to be this high. This isn't Celtic traveling to a uh, a team playing out of one of the big five leagues, right? This is, this is a different situation. And and as good as uh, the Nord is playing right now, it's, uh, you just, I got, you got to take the number here. So Mm -hmm. I I wonder if there's a little bit of post hypiness to Celtic a bit. I think a lot, a lot of folks, including BJ and myself last year in the champions league thought they were going to be able to punch up as a dog under Ange. And uh, they did. A couple yeah, times. Yeah, we'll, we'll always have those 45 minutes yeah, against we will. Real Madrid. And the 80 with minutes. Ange out the door. Yeah. But <laughs> Ange, Ange out the door and like the fact that like the, oh, Celtics back in the Champions League narrative's gone. I think that maybe folks aren't just going to be uh, looking to back them here, uh, especially on the road. But I'm in. I think uh, plus 450 is fine. BJ, what about you? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing here for Feyenoord is that Santiago Jimenez is going to be suspended for the first two matches for Feyenoord. He is their attack. Like, he is everything to them. He is the third of their expected goals so far this season that you're at Tavise. They even brought Uday, you know, a Japanese striker in from Circle Bruges, and he's injured as well. So the attack for Feyenoord is now going to be a little limited. And then Koshu, who was their best midfielder last season, has been sold to Benfica. So, uh the Feyenoord team that we saw last season is not necessarily going to be uh, the team that we see now in the Champions League, and their starting goalkeeper is also injured for this match. And if there's anything I know about Brendan Rodgers, like you said, Michael, adapting to the situation, well, his Leicester teams in the Premier League last season were very, very good and consistently top five at playing through pressure and offensive passes per defensive action. So even if Brendan Rodgers... You know, concedes a lot of possession and still tries to play out of the back against Slot, who's going to obviously high press them like with rec- reckless abandonment. This Celtic team could play through that pressure, and they could give Feyenoord a lot of problems if they get through the first line of the press and get going in transition. So, um, I only projected Feyenoord at about a minus one, or excuse me, I only projected Feyenoord at minus one twenty four. Uh, that before accounting for Santiago Jimenez's in, or suspension. So, uh, Celtic plus one is a good enough price for me uh, to take. Our good old buddy Brendan Rogers once again. When's the next the next round of fixtures is October third. So I figure BJ's got one more Celtic bet in him oh, before he decides to give up. But I, do. I, I think the better way to play Feyenoord is to play them to advance. I know Jimenez is out. Look, I'm concerned about that too. He's been so good for them. But th- this team is putting up like in unreal numbers 
in the Eredivisie without him. The XG difference table is wild. And we'll talk about PSV soon. Uh, but the, the early season XG data from last year and then, you know, getting into this year, uh, it's like ridiculously low, ridiculously good stuff. They have, they have um, blown away the field thus far. Not going to happen on Tuesday, though. <laughs> we'll be blowing away our friend Brandon Rogers. Um, all right, we'll go quickly through the rest of uh, Tuesday slate. Some plays scattered in and out. You guys wanted me to park some time to talk about Lazio and Atleti. Uh, I'm passing. Lazio mm-hmm. at home plus 190 as, a, as an underdog. Mauricio Rash- Sarri and, and his boys are. Yeah, they're not, they're not doing so hot in, right in Syria. Uh, Atleti's suck. coming in off of a of a ugly loss to Valencia. They're plus 150. Uh, and the draw is plus uh, 220 here. Uh, it's a pass for me. I just think it's a... Pretty unappealing on all sides. And we'll just be rooting on our boy Diego uh, as he yeah. marches his way to uh, Champions League glory in, in June. Anthony, what what did you want to discuss about this match? Well, I will have a full preview up for the, uh, the Action Network uh, on Monday night. So you can read my entire thoughts on this match, of which I will have many. Uh, and you know what? We'll make that a tease to try to save time here. Uh, but yeah, I think the the market on the side perspective is pretty much right. You know, the, the the market has moved toward Atleti. I think that we have two overvalued teams, generally speaking, like relative to what I think they are uh, playing one another. How that manifests itself in the actual match, you know, we, we've seen Atleti become a much more attacking team in Spain. That you know, the last eight months, but uh, a, a big part of me thinks that the Champions League version of this team is still going to play kind of like last year and and what we saw in the fall, which was a very anemic attack, some pretty good defending, and they got a little unlucky to not advance. And I, I think that this group is so open. Maybe I might add some Feyenoord to win the group too. So we'll see. But I'm I'm really starting to believe in this Feyenoord team, for better or worse. Okay. Uh, BJ, you're going to do it. Um, yeah. You're going to do it. City is... A prohibitive favorite, obviously, at home against just Red a Star. little favorite Belgrade. Yeah, it's uh, mine, minus eighteen hundred on the three way yep. line. Belgrade, a cool What's twenty eight to one. Twenty eight to uh, one, Michael. I know. Yeah. Not good enough. One. It's not it's, even close to good enough. I need like fifty to think about. I was it. gonna say it's it's, it's got to tick up to like yeah, the, around forty. Um, yeah. And the draw is eleven to one. But yeah, you 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 think Belgrade's gonna make this a real nail biter? Yeah, plus three. Um. <laughs> I mean, I really, if you've listened to this podcast long enough, you know that I can pronounce this this team's name wrong on multiple occasions. I I now know that it's Belgrade. Um, But this team, when I'm going through, you know, doing Champions League projections, I obviously like to use all the XG data from what teams do in their own domestic leagues and use it here for the Champions League because I find it's it's a larger sample size. And then we can obviously, you know, make adjustments for league strength, talent wise, never and whatever, but Red Star Belgrade has consistently year after year put up some of the best XG numbers in their own domestic league that I've seen of any team that's in the Champions League field. Last season, plus 1.62 XG differential per 90, and they've extended that into this season. And if you look through their roster, they do have some talented players. You know, their total transfer uh, squad value is around 75 million, which, you know, is on the bottom tier of teams in the Champions League, but it's not at the complete bottom. And their manager was actually the guy who managed Maccabi Haifa last season in the Champions League. And if you remember that Maccabi Haifa team, their first couple matches against PSG and against Benfica, they did put in pretty good defensive performances. And then obviously as we got deeper into the Champions League and then, you know, they were completely out of it, PSG ran up six on them and Benfica ran up seven. So, you know, obviously that gets, you know, it's not very good, but... This team has been consistently in the Europa League for a long time now. I believe three or four years straight. They've played a lot of upper tier teams. Last year, year they were paired in a group with Monaco, played them even on XG in in both meetings. So I think plus three is a a little too steep here. Um, Projected closer to 2.5 on Belgrade. So um, I I just, I will never stop believing in this, in this club. So um, give me them plus three at city. Uh, well, I'm not feeling inspired. You know, I'm I'm just not. Yeah, that's fine. When they maybe, maybe, City goes to Leipzig next, mm, I can't wait to see what the number is. 
Uh, and and BJ, you're you're gonna be the only one. You're on an island here in uh, Shakhtar and, and Porto yeah. as well. It's Shakhtar's at home, and they're plus three thirty three. It feels yeah. Like long. Um, just even I mean, it's typical. I mean, this is you know the thing with Shakhtar. This is one of the least talented Shakhtar teams that we've seen in a long time because they've been in the Champions League basically every single season for the last five years, and they just don't have much talent anymore. Um, but what we've seen from Shakhtar when they do get in the Champions League is they are especially in that group with Madrid. And Leipzig last season, they were so, so defensive and basically just sent Mudrick out on counterattacks and he hit a couple of them and that's how they got back into the Europa League. But no, they're they're going to sit very, very deep playing a Porto team that's obviously going to play out of a 4-4-2. Uh, I, they, I believe it's just going to be a little bit of a stalemate. I don't believe that this total should be sitting, you know, minus one, two, over 2.5, minus 140. Um, so under 2.5 plus 120 is uh, good enough for me in that match. Uh, Anthony, anything on on young boys and, and Leipzig? Like like I said, I think Leipzig. If if you wanted to wrap them with PSG, uh, looks all right. They've they've been doing their thing in the Bundesliga. That no red flags here for me. Yeah, you know, I I think that Leipzig, if anything, is a little bit undervalued here. Uh, so I would generally agree. You know, when you look at Leipzig, you know, the market did downgrade them, but I think that their market's quickly catching up. Uh, because of the performances they've been putting up in the Bundesliga. So they you know, lose their first match to Leverkusen, a Leverkusen team that we now know is better than we thought. And since then, uh, it has been you know, three consecutive boat racings. And I know the final XG data from the match against Osberg uh, wasn't great because once they were up 3-0, it kind of got away from them a little bit and they conceded a bunch of chances. But that was a, a beatdown today, uh, or Saturday rather. So I am going to say that you know, Leipzig, I'm going to hope they don't win by too many. I'm actually going to root against Leipzig. Like, I hope they win close because if they keep winning by big numbers, the, the market is going to quickly bump them and we are not going to get that many chances to bet them. So hopefully this game is close, but uh, I think that they're going to be able to roll here. Young boys, like they've, like their their squad value is, is, is less than it was last year and they have lost some of their talent. So like they always put a good effort in at home. It seems to be the the trend with them. If you if you go look through their data, and there's other teams that uh, that applies to as well, but I, I don't have a ton of faith in them in this spot. And I think Leipzig just like they can rotate through people and still have like really good attackers on the pitch at all times. So it's just very hard to stop all the waves of attack. Uh, any thoughts from either of you on Barcelona or and versus Royal Antwerp at Camp Nou? Uh, Barca minus five hundred. Antwerp maybe, coming in fourteen to one. Maybe an under three and a half. Uh, anything, you know, minus 115 or, or better, you know, project this around 2.8 goals. The thing about Antwerp, they're really lucky to, to be here. <laughs> like they are the luckiest team that's like at, they actually got into the Champions League. You know, Belgium is the one very few leagues that has a playoff system. They didn't win the regular season and they luck boxed their way and they scored a 94th minute goal from Toby Alderweireld. Uh, from outside the box to win the Belgian league. Then they went and played AK Athens in the Champions League qualification, and they got beat down on XG in both meetings, but luck boxed their way into this thing. So they are a slow, pragmatic build-up team in the, the, the Belgian league. They're not a quick transitional team, which is you know how you have to beat Barcelona. So I don't think they'll be able to score against them. And with rock solid Barcelona's defense has been, um, I could see them winning this 2 nothing, 3 nothing. So... Maybe under three and a half, but other than that, that's a pass. That means we can move on to Wednesday. I think Wednesday, the there's a couple of, of whoppers um, to bet, and one of them is easily the headliner for the first match week. That's Bayern hosting Manchester United. Uh, Bayern's minus 188 at home. United traveling to Bavaria at plus 450. The draw is plus 350. It is time, baby. Oh my gosh. I don't know, man. It is time. Oh. You can't be scared. Like this is this I'm is terrified. Exactly the opportunity we've been waiting for to bet on United. Uh, have we been waiting to bet on United? We, we've been waiting. I haven't been waiting. I haven't been oh, waiting. waiting. This is it. Um I mean they gotta sustain I, I, they gotta sustain some of this. Like they like here's the thing with United. They come out like the first 25 minutes and they just blitz you and they look awesome and they look great. And then they just like completely 
run out of gas and teams just break them down left and right. And all the injuries that have mounted up. I mean, you saw it with Brighton. They just all overloaded the left side. They targeted Dallow. Marcus Rashford doesn't press out of possession. So Brighton just picked him apart. And that's exactly what Bayern Munich can do here. Now, are we really going to play Bayern at, you know, minus 190 or minus one after we saw against Leverkusen? No. Absolutely I'm thinking not. about it. So. <sighs> I'm thinking about it, BJ. Are you? Yeah. I, I think that, mm. You know, Leverkusen played really well. The case to make against Bayern is that they looked kind of lost in build-up at times. Uh, Kimmich was only able to play an hour uh, against Leverkusen. He was pissed to get taken off. But when he's not on the pitch, Goretzka doesn't show for the ball. Like, he's constantly trying to get forward. And thus, there's just nobody there in the middle. Um, But the problem is that like the pace of these wide players for Bayern yeah. against you know these United defenders and the ease at which Brighton was able to just make small tactical tweaks that Deserby made. I mean, it wasn't anything crazy. They just changed into a, like a 4-4-2 diamond and then all of a sudden like uh, the channels were wide open for that. The, they scored the same goal three times. Mm-hmm. Um, like I thought Bayern created a lot of chances at home against Leverkusen. Like, they easily could have won that match. Probably should have. Uh, you know, Herdeski made some good saves. They had some good blocks. Boniface probably should have scored one, too. Like, you know, they were definitely open at the back. Like, the, that's the, the case for United, for sure. Like, Bayern is still open. They will concede chances. But I don't know how United stops this team. I don't either. And, I, and, right. I, and Well, listen, there's one one team is, is plus uh, 450. Yeah. And that's right? the so, argument yeah. for United. That's, like, I'm not, yeah. we're not, this is, we're not flipping a coin here. This is a, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a, Four plus four fifty underdog. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh! Who who is who can score and they do very they score in transition well going against a team that uh, has trouble picking up the pieces when the ball starts going the other way. So yeah, Ca- Casemiro um, had another really bad game on yep. Saturday. He's a champion, and I'm player. starting to I'm starting to sound some alarm bells about. No, he's that. a champion. Yeah, yeah. I think they're starting to have a, a real problem because. You know, he wasn't great in possession, which is like whatever, that's a bad game. But his his covering space numbers, tackling numbers are down. And yep. they are so reliant on him in that system with the way that they're set up right now that it's uh, very fragile. And, um, yeah, I think I, – I wish United was at home because I, I would definitely yeah. love to get them plus a half at home, and I think that would be a very interesting bet. But going away to Bayern is so much more difficult, uh, this, this relentless attack. So it'll be a fun match. I'll probably end up setting it out, to be honest. Yeah. But, and you know if they if they get ripped apart here, Ten Hag seat's gonna get a little warm. Not hot, just just a little warm. We'll see. Our Galatasaray tickets definitely do not need a United victory here. No, gosh, no. no. We need a Bayern. We need a Bayern route. Uh, all right. So I'll be alone on on United. Uh, there. It's, it feels like just the beginning of last year too. Just waiting for the the bottom of the market, and then you then then you snap them up. Uh, Arsenal. Uh, BJ come, came out on top in a uh, podcast derby, hammered Everton one nil. Uh, Arsenal minus two fifty. <laughs> downgraded Arsenal again after their win. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. PSV uh, coming to town. Good luck this coming weekend, to the Emirates. Team stinks. Plus seven fifty and the draws plus three seventy five. PSV also off to a rollicking start in uh, the area de Vise. Uh I'm pretty tempted here. Derby this underdog. weekend, big Champions League return. Yeah, I like the under. Okay. I think Arsenal's got problems. I'm going to say, like I said, the same thing ahead of the Everton match. What? Um, I think their attack is is regressing. Oh my gosh, they're not as good. They're not consistently creating. Uh, it was funny because I had literally was composing the tweet, and then the the color commentator said today on the broadcast. You know, this Arsenal team, they just don't look as fluid in front of goal. They don't look as uh, fluid as they did last year. It's very, it's very. Uh, I don't think he said janky, but he said something, something along those lines. Very stagnant. And I agree. I think that things are kind of off. And I am concerned about their attack and how many goals they're going to continue to keep scoring. Because they just played one of the worst defenses in the league through the first four matches. And created like one expected goal on 13 total shots. The first half, they had 79% of the ball. They took three shots. Um, that's bad. One was varred off. 
One was Vardoff, off, right? But, but like Martinelli again, got hurt. The Everton defenders switch off because Niket, because they're all throwing their hands up. Yeah. They knew Niketi was offside and he was way off. So it was a good run by Martinelli, but now he's down. Yep. Right. So he's out for this match. And Trossard. what's that? Trossard. Yeah. He scored today. Beautiful goal today. Yeah. yeah look, uh, Leandro scores every time he plays, so maybe they should they should be getting him on there. Yeah. But um. PSV, we've talked about them on this show a bunch. They've lost a bunch of attacking talent. They've had a good start in the Eredivisie, but the underlying numbers aren't nearly as good. Uh, they've they've only created six point nine xG in their first four matches, which is uh, you know less than uh, that sounds good. But you have to remember this is the Eredivisie. Uh, so, like for example, Feyenoord has created ten point three, and they're the number one here. Uh, so, you know, I have my question marks about how good this attack's really going to be. And uh, Arsenal will have their first choice defense available. And, and I have to respect their defensive numbers when their first choice has been available. Uh, and it's been quite good. So under three, you know, for me, is going to be the play. And I think Arsenal probably wins this match. I don't think they're going to, you know, get picked off. But I think there's uh, real attacking concerns for this group that those front three, those big three, are just not quite the same this year. Now Martinelli's out. So any Niketia, still mid. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up on uh, PSV. I'll see where the market goes uh, as we get closer. Arsenal and Newcastle kind of remind me of one another in terms of, like they're they're I don't know if they're going to be great teams you're going to want to lay uh, big prices with because I just don't trust them to get separation because they don't create enough consistently. Uh, PJ, this is a they're they're boring boring Arsenal right now. mm Hmm. We said that it's about early, that it's day, early so. era Arteta. It's early era Arteta Arsenal right now. A lot of possession, no, no, it's not. not a lot of high quality shots. That's just the reality. Look, they could prove me wrong. Uh, City certainly did last year, didn't they? Yeah, but uh, I, I think there's I, and, and you know, I mean, I mean, you know. and then look, it's not like like you looked at last year's numbers and you could you could paint the picture. I mean, look at how much. All of their best players all overperformed their XG and all also had career years at the same time. That just like doesn't happen again. And it's not happening. So uh, Sock has been quiet. He'll probably score a goal here just because I said that. He but was really good today. I, he, he was I thought he played well. Yeah, Causing I – mean, Mikalenko's not the, the best. Ca- causing a lot of problems, but yeah. again, right. not creating a ton of big scoring chances at the end, which is like what we're here for. And – um, passed up a couple looks that I thought he was going to shoot, which I thought was interesting too. And then the ball gets cleared. You don't get a shot. You know, interesting. I mean, listen, we've with Arsenal, we've played a bunch of teams that are just going to sit deep and like really low, low, low blocks. So yeah, we've struggled to break down low blocks to like three or four matches, but I think we're really going to find out when we come up here against Tottenham and Bournemouth and even PSV who does press a little bit what Arsenal is actually made of if teams will actually come out and try to disrupt their build to play. So far, we haven't seen that. It's basically just been teams just sitting back and Arsenal has struggled to break down low blocks. That's true. But I think the process is great for Arsenal right now. I think they're controlling the matches very, very well. Even the match against Everton, I know they didn't create a lot, but they were under control the entire match. Like I never really yeah. felt like I'm worried that Everton was going to come and like create a bunch of chances against us in transition. Like, yeah, they've some teams have had a couple moments against us, but we're we're under control right now and that's the biggest thing i think that as we get more and more game control we'll get better and better at breaking down low blocks fair i want to make this clear because people think i hate all the teams or i hate x team you do on them on the podcast. you do though i don't even hate arsenal i you think do. this i mean i do personally but like as a better i don't <laughs> think they're like i don't think they're like we have to we must fade them at all costs i just think that the established market rating of this team right now as an attack is too high because of how good they ran last year that's all. And I think that carries over into this match. He was on display today. I didn't think they were great against United. Will that matter against Tottenham? Because Tottenham's going to play a lot differently. And, uh, you know, we can talk about that this weekend. But I think it's it also, and it's also something about prestige with these teams, Anthony, is like p- p- teams play different styles against, you know, teams that are now at the top of, at the top of the pyramid, right? Like, if Tottenham had the season that Arsenal did with Inch, like if we reach the end of the season and Michael's 44 to one ticket catches and Tottenham wins the title, teams are it's not going right. to come out and teams going. are not going to come out and just press them with reckless abandonment like Burnley and Bournemouth have did like early on in the days. That's what happened with Arsenal. And that's why they had, they ran so good for such a long time. And now teams are like, Oh no, we can't do that to them because they are one of the contenders now. So this is just what happens. It happened to city over and over again. 
And now it's happening at Arsenal. Uh, let's talk about the uh, one of the twelve forty fives. So um, Arsenal uh, and PSV. That's Group B. Uh, United, Bayern, Group A. We're going to jump to Group C now. Uh, this is Real Madrid and Union Berlin. You know, we we kind of snickered at uh, Union Berlin last uh, season for the way they ran, but for this team to be in the Champions League, considering where they were like five years ago, uh, yeah, it's pretty wild. Uh, nonetheless, Madrid is a big favorite, minus 275. Berlin plus 650. Uh, traveling to uh, Spain, and then the draws plus 400. BJ, you're you're the only one with the play here. Yeah, I like the under, a plus money, a plus 115. Uh, Real Madrid, I mean, we've kind of been saying it over and over on this podcast, but you know their whole offense right now is been Jude Bellingham now that Vinicius is injured you know he's scored five of their goals before uh, obviously the match against uh, Sociedad uh, today which was pretty chaotic but again Sociedad did score early on there so Real Madrid had to have more emphasis on going forward but I mean the definition of park the bus is what Union Berlin is going to do in this match they are going to literally I think put 10 guys in the box and I don't know if they're really going to try and do much counterattacking. Uh, in this because one point at the Bernabeu would be absolutely massive for them in this group. So they're going to play, you know, five at the back for the, un, for the, uh, excuse me, for the under to be sitting at plus money with Real Madrid, who still it, has not figured out their striker issues. I mean, Jose Lu before today was getting two and a half shots per 90 uh, in his first, you know, three per, in three La Liga matches. That's quite concerning. And, you know, again, Bellingham being a box invader has been their entire offense. So uh, I think they're going to struggle to break down Union Berlin's low block for large stretches of this match. So I projected 2.2 goals. So under two and a half at plus 115 is a, a pretty decent price enough for me to play it. Yeah, I'm going to be sending this one out. I, I'm, and a Union's tempted, offense is running I'm a little tempted by the draw, honestly. That's, that's the, yeah. the one bet I think I would make. Um, Anthony, anything here before we move on? Well, the thing is, like Real Madrid doesn't do a ton of counter pressing. They'll they'll let you have the ball. Uh, yeah. They will let you, uh, when you win it, kind of try to attack them. But they will not concede a ton of big chances off of that. Now they have gone down early in three of their first five league matches. They've come back to win them all with late winners in every game, of course. But going down early to Getafe going down early to the Sociedad today, going down early. Um, you know, it's, it's been a real thing to Al- Almeria, and then they should have gone down early to Celta Vigo as well. So really, like, VAR bailed them out. It, it's been a bit shaky for Real Madrid here, uh, and I do think they're overvalued. The problem is I'm worried about Union too because we've already seen their defensive numbers start to slide in Germany, and I'm just wondering how sustainable what they did last year defensively. Forget all of the attacking finishing stuff. We've all gone through that. Can they replicate being the best defense in the Bundesliga again? Like, can they sustain that level? I'm a little skeptical of that. So that keeps me very intrigued by this match. I I look forward to watching it, uh, but probably will not be betting it. Okay. uh, One that we will be uh, betting is Benfica and Salzburg. This is a Group D match at uh, 3 p.m. Benfica minus 225. At home, but, uh, Salzburg traveling plus six fifty in the draws plus three thirty three. Anthony, uh, you and I are we're on the same side here. I think uh, Salzburg's live. Yeah, I do. Uh, Benfica's continued to put up remarkably good numbers in the Portuguese Liga, but I think there are some questions about how good they really are. And they've dominated Portugal for so long now that you have to respect it. But remember. You know, what do we know about this Benfica team? They put up these ridiculously good numbers in the Portuguese league, right? They won a group. We all said last year coming into last season, they're so undervalued. They won a Champions League group that included PSG. What do we think of them now? That (laughs) PSG team, looking back. Juventus. What do we think of them now? And then they beat Club Bruges, who I know I bet in the round of 16, but BJ was probably right about them. Horrendous. And then they (laughs) lost to Inter. So... Like this entire Benfica mythology is built off of back-to-back quarterfinals in the Champions League, which is fair. 
They made back-to-back quarterfinals. They luck boxed their way past Ajax before that. But now we're at this inflated market rating on them when they've lost all of their talent. Fernandez is gone. Ramos is gone. Their attack right now is Arthur Cabral and Angel Di Maria. That's kind of shaky to me. So I, I think that there's going to be um, some regression here for Benfica. We don't. To me, Salzburg is a black box because every year they they sell everybody, and then they come in with this new team, and we're like, okay, what is Salzburg? Well, this year they sold Okafor, to their best striker. They sold Adamu, probably their second best striker, or excuse me, third best striker. They sold Sesco, who was probably their second best forward. So like everybody's gone. And we're like, okay, maybe these new guys are good. I mean, Salzburg has a track record of doing that. So I'm going to play against Benfica here, catching almost a goal and a half, a good goal and a quarter. I'm going to play Salzburg on the road. And uh, I'm tempted by the under, but I'm also concerned because Benfica's now, you know, with those dominant numbers in Portugal, conceded over one XG in every match this year in Portugal, and they haven't played any of the top teams yet. So there's Roger Schmid, like press and possess, Versus Salzburg, who's very comfortable playing that style. I think it has flaws, and I think there's, they're going to get exposed here. So Salzburg, for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be on the money hopefully line. Hopefully the new strikers are good. If they're good, this team could be competitive in this group. If they're not, they're probably not, but we're going to find out. It just comes down to we we knew coming into this Champions League that Benfica would be a little bit overvalued based on, uh, like you said, the two back-to-back uh trips to the final eight tip your cap move on a lot of talents left and uh i wanted to play against them right away in this in this champions league and i'm gonna get a chance to do it with a with a live underdog i think at uh plus 650 so salzburg for me let's uh let's move on to sociedad and milan uh or excuse me let's move on to uh sociedad and inter Sociedad plus 210 at home, Inter coming in at plus 137, a road favorite. And the draw is plus 210, BJ. We've identified this uh, Sociedad team as a, a group that we're, we're probably going to be backing, especially as underdogs, and I mean, especially as a home underdog. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I I projected this like dead on at a pick Um So I'm thinking there's a little bit of value here on Sociedad at home. Now, the market has come back from their performance against Real Madrid, which is kind of surprising given how good Inter was against AC Milan. You do, Inter was sitting around plus 120, plus 125 before this weekend's matches, and Sociedad put in a good performance on the road against Real Madrid, and now Inter is sitting at plus 145. So I wanted to play Sociedad, you know, plus a half, because, you know, I thought that <laughs> going into the weekend, my, my thought process was, okay, Sociedad's traveling to... Real Madrid, if they lose and Inter beats AC Milan, which they are a favorite, then I'll get a better price on Sociedad here at home. And now that did not happen. But this Sociedad team is very, very good out of possession. They're the best pressing team in Spain last season by passes per defensive action. Now, what we know about Inter is they're a very direct team. Like they're not going to just build out of the back. Although Sociedad, I believe, will concede possession to them and then try to force them to build out of the back. But just from a price standpoint, I mean, this is a Sociedad team that consistently has put up really, really good expected goals numbers in Spain. And, you know, when you, when you're pricing or using, you know, UEFA wave coefficients or, you know, total transfer market value for these leagues, essentially not the premier league, it's basically La Liga, Bundesliga and Serie A are all kind of just meshed together right now. There's really not a huge gap between the three, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, Sociedad at home, getting a good price, good team out of possession, Good defensive numbers, obviously, under one expected goal per 90 in La Liga last season. Didn't really lose anybody over the summer significantly. Has great attacking players that can really get at the center defense and transition. I think the price is good enough to play Sociedad, uh, draw no bet, anything plus 110 or better. Yeah, it goes in cycles. You know, uh, last year I was really high on Italy. That was very evident if you listened to our podcast at any point during the second half of the season. This year I think I'm up on the Bundesliga I'm not sure yet. I mean, it's too early, but I, I do like Leverkusen. I think I might bet them to win the Europa League, but and Leipzig's Leipzig, but it, it goes in cycles. Like the, the 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 third to like sixth best teams in all these leagues, how good are they actually? It varies a lot, and there's not a huge gap. So I generally agree. I have I have Inter as a slight favorite. I love what Inter did this summer. Like they absolute truck to start the the Serie A season. Concerned the market may not have caught up yet, though, and and I may not have caught up yet. So I'm gonna probably end up passing here 
Um, this market has moved towards Sociedad, like you said, that that has kept me off of this. But but I did bet them to advance. If you listen to our futures episode from way back, you can still find plus 140 out there. Uh, BJ and I wrote previews for all eight groups, which are up on the Action Network site now. Um, so go read through that, figure out our, you know, our favorite futures, who we're looking to bet against. And uh, I am more long game Sociedad here than in this matchup. Braga plus uh, 333, another Wednesday kickoff hosting Napoli. Uh, last year's Darlings, Napoli's minus 120 traveling. Uh, the draws plus 260. BJ, you think this one could be pretty low event? Yeah, so Braga, they're interesting because they've been in the Europa League for a long time now. They've kind of been the like the fourth wheel in, in Portugal forever. You know, it's been Sporting Benfica and, Port, and Porto. And then there's Braga sitting here. They've always been the fourth best team. And last season, they were better than Sporting. So now they have a chance here to play in the Champions League. And throughout all of last season, what really drives me here to the under is that when they have played at home against good teams, they will sit in a 4-4-2. And they have put up good expected goals numbers against those teams. They've held Porto to under one expected goal at home. They held Benefica to under one expected goal at home. They basically kept everybody from last season. And Napoli, it's... Like you mentioned, Michael, they were the darlings last season. If you look through their numbers this season, it's been kind of stagnant uh, to begin. You know, their last match against Genoa, they created under one expected goal. Even against Lazio, even though they were supposed to, you know, they should have won that match, only created 1.3. People know what Napoli's going to do. They know how their slow, pragmatic build-up style. They want to key in on Kabarskelia. They want to create space for Oshman in the middle, and teams are just not allowing them to do that. And that's kind of what you saw. Uh, especially against Lazio, where, yes, they didn't deserve to win it, but they also clogged the middle of the pitch very well and took away two of Napoli's best players. And I'm not sure Napoli really has the other players to really, really effectively break down decent low blocks. And we'll see. Maybe I'll be wrong, and they'll win this match 3-0 on the road. But especially going on the road here when Bennett, when uh, excuse me, Benfica, Braga is going to sit in a 4-4-2 and does have some talented players to be able to get at them in transition. I think it's a decent spot to back an under. I only projected 2.3 goals, so under 2.5 at, at plus 110 is, is good enough for me. Uh, Anthony, anything you wanted to add here? Yeah, you know, the thing is about Braga, though, like they weren't actually that good last year. No, That's they weren't. Why, like, they, they still had the fourth best underlying numbers. Sporting just kind of ran bad. Uh, so to put this in context, you know, Porto and Benfica this year already are at 5.2 and 5.8 expected goal difference. Uh, Port, uh, Benfica this year, uh, uh, I, I keep saying, I did the same thing. I know it's okay. too close. I keep saying it too. too. It's... Okay. Let me restart <laughs> from the top of the whole Braga thing. The, th- the thing about three, two, one, the thing about Braga though, is that they're like not actually that good in Portugal. They finished last year with the fourth best underlying numbers. They got in because sporting ran really bad all year this year already Porto plus 5.2 XG difference total Benfica plus 5.8 Braga is plus one. Uh, now it's a small sample and you know, they haven't played any of the top teams either, but Braga last season was a st- huge step below those other Portuguese teams. And look, we've seen Portugal do well in this tournament. And so I'm not going to discount them. The market has moved toward Napoli here, which is why I'm not betting them anymore. I'm really mad because I missed a minus 105 and now it's like minus 120, 25, 30. And I don't want to lay that. So I'm passing. But if you see money come back in on Braga and it's not injury related to Napoli, I'm happy to fire on Napoli. Two poor results, Lazio, Genoa, but again, we, we have enough of a sample to know what this team is, and I still really like the midfield. I think they're going to be very effective in Champions League. Uh, the Bayern uh, United, that's uh, Group A. The other Group A match is Galatasaray out of Turkey, minus 167, uh, hosting Copenhagen, plus 425. We need this one to, to, to advance. Yeah, yeah, and I was about to say, like, we're, I don't think we're, we're going to be on – this match no, in particular, because the all three of us, high. yeah, all three of us are on uh, on the Turkish club here. Um, should be. I, a- I mean, I, I I am tempted to lay the one uh, because Copenhagen's results home and away have been extremely extreme. They have been basically non relevant away from home, but they actually had three draws last year against City, the lucky red card, but against City, against Dortmund, and against Sevilla, they were better than Dortmund and Sevilla in the away mat in the home matches away from home. They got the break speed off them in all three matches. So I think that there's real 
home and away splits there that are that are more meaningful maybe than the market is capturing. And this has gone back a couple of years now with Copenhagen when they've been in the Champions League. So maybe I'll lay the one. But again, I'm kind of just double leveraging myself on the same position, which is that Galatasaray is underrated by the market. And thus, I do think they're a little undervalued here, but I'm not betting them necessarily. I'll, I'll have to think about it. You know, yeah, I, like so, I was, was going to say Copenhagen last season in the Danish Super League conceded uh, over 1.4. XG per 90. That's second worst of anybody in the Champions League behind only Sevilla. So, yeah, not a great defense. The They're very young. They're very young. Like, they have a lot of young players, and that gets sold usually at the end of, you know, this cycle or whatever it is. But, um, yeah. I think if, if it were me, I would I would just wait. If you have a Galatasaray to advance ticket, I, I would just kind of want to wait and see what, what Copenhagen is now in the Champions League. And it is it is one of the twelve forty fives. The other one is his yeah. Madrid and in Union. But uh, the atmosphere for uh, Galatasaray is going to be oh. one of the uh, best home field advantages in Europe. Yeah, honestly, so, worth a watch. And uh, if you're sweating the uh, two advanced numbers with us and so on, and the the two fifty to one to win the the whole shebang. That's true. We forgot about yeah. that. Yep. We want to get off on the right foot. Uh, all right, we, we saved the best for last, and that's BJ's boys, Sevilla, uh, minus one eighteen at home hosting Lens, plus three twenty, and the draw is plus two fifty. Nothing here for me, uh, BJ. Yeah, I really, I mean, I really wanted to fade Sevilla in this, and then I ran my projections, and I was like, ah, you know, I have Sevilla sitting around, you know, plus one twenty. So, I mean, I could make a case for the Lens, but they've been so bad out of the gates here. You have uh, Lens and- better than Sevilla? That's crazy to me. In this count, yeah, of course. Well, I mean, uh, lens is lens has lost. Uh, I mean, for five, I know, Fonda, man, that was like but, everything. But, but here's they already the had their, their insanity run is over. But Sevilla's numbers have been so bad for so no. long. Like I can't, I can't get over a minus eight to expect a goal differential in, in Spain, Anthony. That's that's awful. Like I understand yeah. they won the Europa League. It was a complete luck box. And yes, lens has lost everybody. But I mean, yeah, as a slight, I would have them as a slight, slight favorite in a neutral field. Yeah, I would. I mean, they're not, it's still early. Like, you know, I understand they lost everybody and they've been horrible out of the gates. And by the time we're halfway through this and these two teams are playing on the final match week, like, yeah, I probably might, will have Sevilla as a, a neutral field favorite, but as it stands right now, no, I would have lens as a, a slight favorite on the road. Yeah. So for me, on neutral like, field, excuse me. Sevilla at home, happy to have the ball and do nothing with it. Lens does not have the attacking playmaking to do anything right now to expose what is a pretty weak Sevilla defense. Like this would have been, I mean, if Oponda and Fofana still played for this team, I would have loved, loved to bet Lens as a road dog here. But like, I don't know how, I don't know how Lens creates chances consistently as bad as Sevilla has been. So I think that there's, you know, maybe an under, but I have enough unders on the board that I like more. That I'm sure. not going to. I'm not going to sit down for the Champions League Tuesday with six unders and say, "All right, here we go, guys." It's yep. Never fun. Um, and I have a couple that I like more, so pass. All right, I'm hoping for a draw because that'll be good for uh, the rest of the group, which I, you know, think they're going to advance from. That wraps up the uh, the big board. Pretty good job. Sixteen matches. We got to. Spend a little time with each one of them, uh, but now we'll give out our favorite bets for match week one in the Champions League. Anthony, you can go first. AC Milan, Newcastle, under two and a half, plus 120. I think this match sets up as the first group stage match where both teams don't really want to lose it. And we have constantly seen, if there's anything true about Pioli and how, how will not take chances in possession. Milan will not take chances out of possession. AC Milan, you know, their attack has become a little bit stagnant on on just Liao thus far. Um, I like the additions they've made, but again, playing against an elite defense, which Newcastle is, it's going to be hard for them to consistently create chances, and Newcastle's not going to take those chances out of possession. So the longer this game stays a stalemate, the less I think this game opens up. So uh, under 2.5, I think it should be, you know, minus 110, but I'm getting plus 120, so I'm going to take the under. For me, I'm going Manchester United, baby. On the money line, plus 450. One of the best practices you can develop in sports betting. I don't care what sport it is, Anthony. I don't care if it's 
soccer. I don't care if it's rugby union. I don't care if it's rugby league. I don't care if it's baseball. <laughs> I'm not even finding... sure some of those are sports. <laughs> finding the right time to buy low, and this is it. The United stock price, quite literally, on the stock exchanges has plummeted after some ugly, ugly performances domestically, uh, most recently against Brighton. Uh, but we know that this team is more likely than not to figure things out. And I think this matchup actually fits what they're trying to do pretty well. They can uh, cause Bayern, a team that is absolutely dangerous going forward uh, and, and could just as easily route this match uh, and make me look foolish. But they have some serious issues when uh, the, the ball starts going the other way and gets quick transition teams. And when United's at their bets, that's what they're doing. So I'm going to take a shot. Not many people going to be on United after the, the performances we've seen. That's when I like to get in. Friendless in the market, the Red Devils will be, but I'll be there for them. Plus 450. BJ, what do you got? Let's keep the fun rolling with the unders. Real Madrid, Union Berlin, under 2.5 at plus 115. Union Berlin is quite literally going to park the bus at the Bernabeu in front of the 18-yard box. And I have real concerns about how Real Madrid is actually going to effectively break down low blocks. In the past, they've had Kareem Benzema, who is an elite striker and really helped them you know, cr- break down these teams that are going to play five at the back. Now they don't really have a striker. It's just Jose Lu in the middle of the pitch. Uh, it, you know, if, if Federico Valverde and Jude, and Jude Bellingham have been you know, great going forward, getting a decent number of production, but you know, without Vinicius Jr. on the left, it's that there's really not a lot of attacking players that can really get into the box. And so it's easier when you're Real Madrid and you're playing, you know, specifically in transition and can get Jude Bellingham to invade the box. But when Hunyan Blin is going to sit eight guys just jam-packed in the middle, it's going to be very, very difficult to break them down. They had great defensive numbers in Germany last season. They've had had a couple bad performances, but they had a great performance at Wolfsburg over the weekend. I know they lost two to, two to one, only conceded 0.4 xG. So uh, Union Berlin is going to be playing for a point, and it's going to be a very slow, sluggish match. I only project 2.14 goals, so I like under two and a half at plus 115. All right, uh, that'll do it for our first Champions League match week preview of the season. Good to be back on Sunday nights, uh, recording with you two gentlemen. We will be back on Thursday morning in your feed to preview the upcoming Premier League slate. North London Derby. Yeah, can't wait. And another Everton loss. Who's Everton play this week? Uh, They they lose. They're losing three one to Brentford. Oh Uh, god, at Brentford, right? Yes. uh, So it's already over. Um, but yeah, that's what we're looking forward to. I. I might not be here. Don't be alarmed. It's not Everton related. Uh, it's wedding Michael, related. Michael ran out of money. He needs to. He needs to pick yeah. up a side. Job. He ran out of money betting Everton. He needs to pick up a side job on Wednesday it's, nights. It's, uh, it's more. Uh, yeah, I just don't want to talk to them. Talk about them. I I watched that match on a, on the plane and yikes. Anyways, uh, for Anthony DeBundo and BJ Cunningham, I'm Michael Lee Buff. Best of luck with uh, your first Champions League bets uh, of the season. 